Hey everyone, welcome back to the Fox 43 Capital Beat. I am Matt Mazel, and our guest today is the policy chairperson for the Senate Democrats in Pennsylvania, Senator Katie Muth, joining us uh, today. Thank you so much, Senator, for uh, being our guest today. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. And guest, uh, I, I should add, uh, right right there in the, in the background, uh, who do we have joining us today? This is uh, Vinny. He needs to be involved in everything. So Vinny's here and Kermit's to my to my uh, right. So he may pop in, but this is their usual nap time. So maybe they <laughs> <laughs> will curl up on the couch. <laughs> so Kermit also a dog, though, not not the frog. Not the frog. He's a dog. Yeah, he's he's in a blanket. If you can, <laughs> he's fine. This, this guy, on the other hand, needs all the attention. <laughs> well, we, we uh, listen, uh, when we're doing the Capitol Beats, uh, the more guests, the merrier. Uh, thank you again. <laughs> and uh, I mean, obviously, we want to talk about policy and, and whatnot. You are the Democratic policy chair for uh, the, the Senate Democrats. But I also want to have some fun with this. And, and here we are, we're a week away from uh, Thanksgiving. And I, I kind of want to hear from you, what is Thanksgiving like in the Muth household? household? Um, well, since I've been elected to office, we try to go back to Western PA to see my dad, but between COVID, um, we have not been back there. So I'm hopeful that we get to go back to what my dad lives in Westmoreland County. So um, if not, my husband will probably make a turkey and you know, it'll be low key, but hopefully we get to make it back. <laughs> where, where in uh, West Moco? In Westmoreland County, I lived, um, I, I grew up in Delmont, but my dad lives in Greensburg now. So it's out, right outside of Pittsburgh. Like yeah, 45. no, I, I'm, uh, I, I, as so I worked in Johnstown for the first uh, seven and a half years of my career. I was born in Pittsburgh. So uh, you know. <laughs> listen, the, the Western Pennsylvania is uh, strong in my blood. Uh, that's good to know. So, I mean, when you do Thanksgiving, is it on a traditional Thanksgiving? Um, are, are you the, uh, are you a turkey person? Are you a sides person? Uh, how, how does that normally work with you? I'm a mashed potatoes person, but I will eat the turkey, of course. Um, my grandmother's no longer with us, but she made amazing uh, cranberry salad. So we still make that uh, in, in honor of her. So that's one of my favorites. But yeah, I'm a mashed potatoes lover. I could probably live on mashed potatoes. <laughs> uh, I mean, mashed potatoes, that's the number one, the number one side. I, I, I in doing a little bit of research before this, I also saw that you have a, a master's degree in athletic training, which also, which goes directly juxtapose that with uh, Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, are, are you the type of person? Cause I know my dad is, is this type of person where he's in the gym the next morning, like he'll feel guilty about eating and he's in the gym the next morning. Uh, are you that person or do you kind of this, this is my cheat day and my cheat black Friday. And then I'll, I'll be back in, uh, uh the start of next week. We usually try to take a walk on Thanksgiving day, but before I was elected and I was an athletic trainer, I actually never got to spend Thanksgiving with my family because I usually work football. Um, so I spent a lot of Thanksgivings um, in other states traveling because teams would play on Thanksgiving day. So um, I, I, it's nice to not have to do that, but um, yeah, no, I, I think you got to move around a little on Thanksgiving day, but I think it's a day that if, you know, you just, I'm a grazer. I can eat all day long, no matter what day of the year. <laughs> were, were, you, were you working with, uh, with high school, like an athletic trainer for high schools or, or how, how were you working in football? Um, in division one football. So obviously they have games around the holiday season. Yeah. That everybody likes to watch on the holidays, but that requires, um, the medical staff to be with those teams. So I've, I've spent, um, Christmas Eves and, and Thanksgiving Eves and Thanksgivings at in other states, um, getting a to-go box after the game. <laughs> who, who are you with? I was I went to grad school in Arizona, so I was with Arizona State. Um, so yeah, it's you know you I, didn't have Thanksgiving at home, you couldn't go home. <laughs> our sport, our uh, our sports reporter and uh, morning anchor Alex Cauley is a uh, Sun Devil, so I will uh, there you make go. sure I pass, I, it I pass on. this along. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so you go from athletic training to, uh, to Senate and being one of the youngest senators uh, elected uh, back in 2018, you started in 2019. Uh, how did that kind of come about for you that that kind of turn into activism? Well, after the 2016 election, obviously I, um, you know, was upset, but I think prior to that, what I learned throughout my career and my, you know, education and athletic training 
and dealing with um, student athletes um, and in high schools or division three schools that didn't have health insurance coverage that was adequate. Um, I, that was my first real deep dive into pay to play politics relative to trying to get people health care and how expensive it is. And it's like, why is this even for myself in grad school, like part of my student loans was having to pay for my own health insurance. And that was before the Affordable Care Act. So I have I was born with a cataract. I was paying, you know, out the wazoo just for basic coverage because it's a pre-existing condition. And so. I've, I've learned how to negotiate with, for knee braces that aren't covered under insurance or worked with other um, orthopedic surgeons from Arizona State that were kind enough to send, um, you know, their physician assistants to our football games in the high school setting where kids literally had um, the basic bare bones health insurance. So for me, it was learning how much and prescription drugs, right? People that have surgery, mm -hmm. there's things that aren't covered. So it's like, why does this cost so much? And you realize um, the rules you know, allow for this and those entities donate to politicians. And so when you think about government, it's supposed to work for the people, not a special interest. And for me, I was like, who is my state senator? Who does this job in Harrisburg? I've never heard of them. I never met them. And um, I've lived here my whole life in Pennsylvania, minus going to grad school. But, you know, it's like our state has a lot of work that needs done, you know, and I didn't know those things prior to becoming a senator. I want to do a segment like 100 things I've learned since being a senator, because some of them are really like you assume there there's protections in place or you assume there's some level of fairness and equity and there's not. And so for me, it was I could do this job and and do this job for the people. And I'm, you know, up until I believe Senator Capaletti was elected. Um, I think, and Senator Saval, I mean, I take no special money from, I don't take any special interest money. I'm the only person in the Senate. I have small dollar donors and there's a lot of power in that because I make my votes based on what's best, not just for the people in my district, but my vote impacts everyone in this Commonwealth. And so um, I can look at both sides of the issue and say, I'm not bought and paid for by fill in the blank special interest. And, I, and I'm really grateful that people you know, invested in me, but then also voted for me because I'm, you know, I haven't become a different person since I was elected. How do you balance, because you mentioned the, uh, the, the, the votes that you cast are, you know, uh, for the people of the Commonwealth, how then do you do balance being in the minority party where the votes tend to not go Democrats way in, in the Senate or, or the House for that matter? Um, do you, look to do what's best for maybe the people that voted you into office or something that gives the best chance to, to become law? I mean, that's a really good question. I think a lot of the advice we're given or in the minority is like, vote your district, vote your district. And I, I genuinely believe that if you take the time to um, educate your district about the issues, like I said, there's a lot of things I did not know prior to becoming a senator. I didn't know that child marriage was still legal in Pennsylvania until like two years ago. I didn't know that we don't, we're the only state without well water standards. Like all of these things that if you go out and talk to the electorate, which is what I did to win, I had to knock with an army of volunteers over 110,000 doors to get elected because I, I don't, I'm, you know, I wasn't a millionaire campaign to be on TV or whatever. And I don't even think that's the path to victory. I think my path to victory engaged in a lot of conversations at the door with Republicans, independents, Democrats. Um, and now that I'm in office, I still owe them that same level of public awareness, like, hey, this is what the issue is. Here are the facts. This is why I'm voting the way I'm voting. And I'm one of the few people that literally read every bill. <laughs> and so, or at least try to, because sometimes um, we get an amended version and they literally make you vote on it before you can read it, which is frustrating. But again, like I can justify to my district, this is why I voted. And for me, um, you know, I do believe that if there's an issue impacting me or my district, let's say the pipeline, that's a huge controversy in my district. If it can be plowed through anybody's backyard, through their kid's playhouse and through a library and a, and a nursing home, that just doesn't happen in Senate District 44. That means that can happen in all 67 counties, this Commonwealth. And so um, I think if an issue is directly impacting my district, it indirectly impacts everywhere else in the Commonwealth. And that's the same thing. I might not have the same issues in other people's districts, but it impacts the people that I represent as well. And that's our job. We should be educating the public on, on those impacts. So, so you represent a district that is, I mean, 
there, there's there's a split there. It's uh, not like a you know maybe some other districts which are heavy heavy Democrat or heavy heavy Republican. There's there's a good mix in in covering Montgomery, Berks, and, and Chester counties. So with that in mind, there's a lot of Republican votes out there as well who disagree vehemently with maybe some of your policies. So how what responsibility do you have as their senator to represent them along with represent the people that did vote for you? I mean, I represent everyone. So anyone that reaches out to our office, um, I if they have an, a, a complaint or, an, or advocating for a bill that maybe I don't support, I don't just send thanks for your feedback, have a nice life. We send a response that's very thorough with links that says, here's why we believe, why we're, we don't support or why we do support this. And it's not everyone agrees with me, but I will say that what my district knows, and there are some people that certainly did not vote for me that have reached out since I've been elected and said, you know what, I don't agree with you on this, but I appreciate that you took the time to explain the issue, why you voted, the way you voted. And I've built trust that way with my electorate. So sure, there are more Republicans, I think, um, now there's about 5,000 more Republicans in my district. But when I first ran, there was over 15,000 more. So, but I have a large, large number of independent registered voters, over 30,000. And so, um, unfortunately, it's a two party system in Pennsylvania because I don't always agree with the Democratic machine either. So, um, I've called How does that out- affect your policy then? Because, as, well, and, and I'm just moving the conversation yeah. forward. I mean, as, as policy chairperson for Senate Democrats, if you don't represent uh, or agree with maybe what the, the, the base is saying, how do, you, uh, how do you then kind of make and, and promote different policies? Um, I don't, it's not necessarily what the base is saying. It's sometimes what the political machine is saying from the Democratic Party. So I think that from a value standpoint, yes, I'm a Democrat. Um, there, I, I, I get that. But there are some policies that my colleagues advocate for that I don't fully or support at all. Like um, well, I mean, originally, I'll use a great example. Um, Sunday hunting. My dad's a hunter. I just told you where I grew up. We have a hunting cabin in Bedford. Like it's not a thing to me. Right. And so um, Vinny's very upset about Sunday hunting as you can hear. If if people are, (laughs) if people are listening to this uh, with my dog, that's not, that's not my belly. That's not my stomach. Uh, I just, I just ate an early lunch, uh, but, but no, Senator Muth has, uh, has her her dogs with her. (laughs) <laughs> yes, he's right here. Come here. Uh, he's just laying there angry that he's not on on right. camera. Moment so, of levity um, on the Fox Forty Three Capital beat. I'm sorry. I, continue. Yeah, I'm. This is this is the Booth household. Um. No, but I said to Senator Brewster, who really supported the bill, I actually called my dad and I'm like, "What do you think about Sunday hunting?" Because he's a hunter. I'm like, he's going to give me an honest, you know. And he's like, "I want the animals to have a day of rest." I'm like, "What is it?" So. <laughs> And that's actually a thing. So, but then I learned that in Pennsylvania, you can already hunt like coyotes 365 days a year with an AR-15 off your back porch if you want to. And that's legal. So why are we bickering over this, however many handful of Sundays to shoot deer and bear and whatever else? And I'm like, you know what? I can get there. I voted for Sunday hunting. They're responsible gun owners. I'm not like this mm-hmm. radical, like lock everyone. So I, I am fully aware of that. I don't know everything. And I rely on feedback from experts, voters, whomever to take that into consideration to see what policies I support. Right. And so I had the most amendments on the floor last session. And that's because I try to make every bad bill better, or at least add something in it. That's actually you know, going to help the Commonwealth versus dupe them. So, I mean, for me, I'm the policy chair. I have to do what members request, right? Hearings on what members request, but I haven't yet had a a hearing where I didn't agree with the premise, but I think if I disagree with a testifier, which has occurred, then you ask Mm -hmm. questions because that's the purpose of the hearing, right? Is to get it on the record so the public can learn and understand. So at least in the Senate, you need 25 votes because with, with, Lieutenant Governor Fetterman being a tiebreaker, you need 25 votes. And Democrats have what, 21? We have 21 votes. Yeah. And I didn't know that, right? Like, does the public know that the whole Senate is controlled by the rules that are created by the majority party? Nope. Didn't know that. (laughs) I ran for office. I'm like, what? I can't run a bill out of a committee. 
nope <laughs> like you right can't you, do you don't you don't have <laughs> right you don't have the power to to bring it up in committee that comes from the majority leader so with that in mind how do you balance the what you want as a democrat as the policy chairperson for the senate democrats versus what realistically can move forward and have a chance to get to the governor's desk um, you know, I think it's less than 7% of Democratic bills get a vote. Um, I actually had one of my bills amended into another bill that wasn't great, and I still had to vote for it, but it was to end the use of defense of consent, consensual sexual activity with for police officers in the custody of someone, because you could still use that as a defense um, in transit to, you know, a, a you know, a police building or whatever. And so they amended it into not a great bill. And I'm like, great, now I have to make this decision. So I think the most powerful thing you can do in the minority is speak on the record on the floor of the Senate before a vote um, and during petitions at the end and say, these are the reasons we should be actually focusing on this issue. Or if it's a bill I don't agree with, I stand up before the vote and I respectfully disagree with the maker of the bill, or I ask them questions. And I think that that's fair. If your bill's getting a vote on the floor, you better damn well be able to stand up and defend and explain what it is and why you crafted it the way you do. Um, so I use all those policy hearings, all the information to craft those time, types of questions and bring you know my opinion prior to the vote to the floor of the Senate, because that's on the record. And I think it's important you don't see the public having on the PA Legis website bill analyses, do you? I've begged, I've begged to post our internal bill analyses because don't just post a memo that says this wonderful headline that if, you know, I would have read that prior to being a senator, I would have assumed it meant what it meant. And you and I both know the devil's in the details on a lot of this legislation, and it's not always what, it, what the title of a memo is. So, so here's kind of what I'm wondering. Pennsylvania is one of, I think, seven states that has a split government where the legislature is controlled by one party and uh, the governor is uh, in control of another party. And in this case, uh, you know, you've got both House and Senate Democrats do this and, and Republicans do this as well. We're seeing this right now with the gun legislation that the governor's already come out and said that uh, he's going to veto uh, the concealed carry legislation, which passed out of the Senate uh, yesterday that is uh, going to pass out of the House. Governor said he's already going to veto it. Um, it is a, a verbal dead end. That's right there. And a lot of times Democrats put together bills that have no chance at even getting brought up in committee. So I guess it, it, the, the, the blunt way of asking the question is, why are we wasting time? But I know there's a, a lot more delicacy in that question rather than saying wasting time. Do, do you view it as wasting time? I think it's an abuse of power. I think that to not, if you want to vote your conceal, whatever, whatever that gun bill was that let everybody just pack heat without a license. That's what I should, I call it, pack heat without a license, open, close. It doesn't matter. And my, and full for the record, my father and my stepmom are both have a license to carry. So like, I'm not anti-gun, but, um, you know, then run our bills, vote down our bills, go on the record and vote down our legislation. Cause it, you're right. It never sees the light of day out of committee. We have to introduce legislation as minority members to show what we stand for. Does it uh, does it come up for a vote? Probably not, right? Statistically speaking, but it is a waste of time because you know Pennsylvanians are worried about a lot more than this issue of guns. Like, so your if, issue is let's have the debate. Let's have the debate, but run our bills, then vote them down. Then show where you are because this is what happens: the majority party runs their bills, and they do this. You're right; the governor's going to veto this. You know what it does? It's fundraising emails for their base. And that's and this is where we've been for the last year is just let's do these emergency declaration, all this stuff. Right. Anti-mask, anti-vaccine. It's like the majority of Pennsylvanians want this pandemic to end and the majority of Pennsylvanians don't want to harm other people. But every time we go to session, it's a fundraising email for them for 2022. And this is the gridlock that we're in and that the public doesn't always see. So you mentioned the emergency declarations, and I think that's a really good segue to what I kind of want to ask you. And, and we're seeing it this week where uh, the House State Government Committee passed through another round of constitutional amendments. And the Republican Party in Pennsylvania has, uh, we saw this a couple years ago with the emergency declarations, and we're, we're seeing this uh, some more now where 
if they know that the governor is going to veto something, they can pass constitutional uh, amendments and they're going to ultimately have the votes in the election because that's what history tends to say. If it's a yes or no vote, you're going to vote yes. That's just what kind of the, the history says. So why isn't the Democratic Party trying to work more with the Republican Party to find something that can maybe get passed by the governor in terms of some sort of agreement rather than just saying, no, our, our hands are, are clean of this. Good luck. Um, I will say that the, the constitutional amendment method is, is back to what I just said. It's an abuse of power because if they were running our bills that were a constitutional amendment, because their argument is let the people decide, but you're only letting the people decide on Republican constitutional amendments. So I want to be real clear about that. And I'm not being partisan. You can go look that up go see where the democratic, any democratic constitutional amendment has made it out in that, in the house or Senate, it has not. So democratic bills don't get brought up period. But that's my point. If they were, if the Republicans truly the majority party said constitutional amendments, let the people decide on the ballot, then why are you only running your own constitutional amendments? I, I understand if you're frustrated with the governor, I'm a Democrat. So is Tom Wolf. I've not, I've not been on the bandwagon of praise everything he does because he's a Democrat. I've been very critical on certain issues that he deserves that criticism for. Um, and for me, you can't work across the aisle with people who literally would, who have voted down. We tried to change the Senate rules at the beginning of the session, myself and Senator Lindsey Williams voted down they didn't want, they wouldn't even let us call our own hearings as minority chair people on a bill, a hearing. Like our amendments were fair. If we were in the majority, I would say that's how the rules should be as well. And they, you can't have a discussion about, hey, let's be productive when it's it's always a behind the scenes negotiation. You can't, you can't negotiate with people who aren't there to serve the people. It's just, it's not, it's, you're going to end up with mediocre outcome or if not a harmful one. And um, this isn't partisan because there are Democrats that still do that kind of bidding, right. And still think they can negotiate. And we just um, I'll be blunt. There's the majority party is very, they lie better than the Democrat, than the minority can tell the truth. And it's, it's a, it's to our detriment that we have failed to do that. It's to the democratic party's detriment that you have failed to lie as well. I mean, we, as no, we, no, that's not what I said. Okay. That the majority party is able to sell a complete, you know, a lie. And we as Democrats are so frazzled in the minority um, that, you know, we're not on a sound message across two chambers, right? Like we're, we're not able to fight that fight the way they have orchestrated it for decades. We're just not that kind of machine. And, um, and once you tell the people the truth, like people in, in our districts, and you educate them on this stuff, it's not um, it's not partisan anymore. It's made partisan in that building. Is there anywhere that you view Democrats and Republicans can work together? I know you said that that you don't want to work with uh, people that won't listen to you. Is there some place, though, where Democrats can move their policies forward with Republicans that there can be some sort of bipartisan work in, in coming up down the pipeline. Yeah. And I think I just want to correct. I, it's not that people that won't listen to me is that they're, they're not even willing to entertain any of our ideas or any of our legislation. So it's not, they're just not, they're just not going to do it. And, and that's just, right. and, and, to, and, to, and to, to your point, I mean, we, we did a, a story last uh, we did a story back in May that kind of analyzed the 2019-2020 session. Um, and I think the of the you know, all the bills that were brought up, I think you, you brought up the point, I think seven uh, percent. There were three bills, uh, three Senate bills from Democrats uh, made it to the governor. Um, so, yes, I mean, the, the statistics back up what you're saying. And I just wanted to add that as context. Yeah, exactly. And I think for me, I'll give you a great example where there's partisan bipartisan support is um, I actually had a bill run out of committee um, and I was fell off my seat. Um, but because I'm very um, controversial in the Senate, um, you know, it, it is what it is. But it's a bill that literally requires consent of a patient prior to going under anesthesia 
to be um, examined either through a rectal exam, prostate exam, or a pelvic exam by a medical student. Because right now in Pennsylvania, that's legal. They don't need your consent to do those types of exams under anesthesia. And I introduced it last session. Uh, Representative Fiedler has it in the House. And um, we reintroduced it this session. And Senator Brooks, who's the chairwoman, majority chairwoman of the health committee, called me horrified that this was legal in Pennsylvania and didn't know. <laughs> but I'm like, neither did I. And so, I mean, you could go back and watch the hearing footage. I'm, I have no eloquent speech. I've never gone to a committee to speak on behalf of my bill because I've never had a bill voted out of committee. And I say, I look at the committee, which is majority Republican, and there's men on the committee too. And I'm like, I think we can all agree that we don't want things like probed in and out of our bodies whenever we haven't consented to it. So I'm glad this bill is coming out. And it was so awkward, but they're all looking at me like horrified. I'm like, yeah, this can happen to you. And that's where there was some agreement. So like, hey, I'll take what I can get. But um, it hasn't come up on the, yet for a floor vote. But but I do believe there's common ground. I've had wonderful, um, agreeable conversations, productive conversations with Senator Brooks, um, Senator Baker, um, Senator Stefano and I work very well together on the Veterans Affairs Committee where I'm the minority chairperson. So there's progress there in terms of individual members. It's just um, you don't see it reflective in what's brought up on the legislative calendar. You mentioned uh, how you are viewed as a controversial figure in, in the Senate, and, and it's hard not to take that statement and look back on what happened back in June of 2019, when you're six months into this job. And you mentioned even earlier in this conversation about things that you didn't know about being in the Senate. And then all of a sudden you're in this position uh, and basically caught in the middle between a shouting match between uh, the two most powerful people in that room. So what did you learn from that moment? And do you regret that that happened? I learned in that moment that my true power um, and obligation is to share people's stories that are impacted by Pennsylvania's laws and decision-making within the budget process. And also that, um, that I had to speak the truth in this job and that that wouldn't always fare well with others. And I think that's a very epic example of a reaction to me simply reading the statement of a man who was at a press conference the day before in the Capitol asking the General Assembly not to end a general assistance program for people in need. And I am literally reading his words. I'm not, this isn't, you know, me Mm -hmm. spouting off. This is me reading. No one else attended this press conference on the other side of the aisle. And that ignited like the most I, I, I would have never, I had 12 amendments, 13 amendments for that bill. And we got shut down. They knew we had them. I didn't hide them. I'm like, here's what we want to try to amend. They would have all been voted down. And to her credit, Senator Brooks, let me put up seven of them in her committee and let the democratic process go through. She didn't shut it down, which I, and all those amendments got voted down, but she didn't stop me from allowing to participate in democracy. Right. And so when this came out on the floor, They shut down after one amendment. And I said to Senator Costa, I understand that I can't put up any more of my amendments. I want to read Mr. Boyd's statement. And that's all I want. I just Mm -hmm. want to have his statement on the record. And that was what was supposed to happen in that moment. And I watched that footage and I'm not, um, sometimes I'm like, like, I was like, I don't, not that I don't remember it, but it was, I was very focused on reading his, his words to the point where I was had to use my finger to follow along because this shouting was so loud. Um, and it was in size 12 font, not double space. So, like, <laughs> so when, when it when it blew when it blew up, it caught you off guard. Well, I just didn't, I would have never thought that reaction would have come out of the leader. You know, it was very like reactionary. And if you see behind me, um, then Senator Farnese is sitting in a chair behind our podium, and he the entire time I spoke kept saying, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Because I mean, it was so loud and I didn't know if I would continue to be recognized. Right. And so I just kept reading. Um, and you know, at some point you hear me shout a little bit louder because towards the end of it, I was so angry that like 
all I'm doing is reading this man's statement. Like, what is this happening? Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> do, do you regret that that happened though? I mean, do you feel six months into your, uh, in your job that, that maybe that, uh, gave you a, a, an unfair reputation? No, because I told the truth and I don't ever regret telling the truth. And that person's truth needed to be told. And I, um, I'm an, I, I had the honor of being able to, to tell it. And that is where we have to end. Uh, Senator Katie Muth, uh, thank you so much for joining us on the Fox 43 Capital Beat, a tremendous conversation. And uh, we'll have to do this again sometime. Absolutely. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving to you and your family. You too. Thank you. <laughs>